Let's shift now to teaching the skills needed for efficient telescope use. As a refresher, those telescope skills are localization, fixation and focusing, spotting, scanning, tracing, and tracking. As with magnifiers, telescopes come in all shapes, sizes, colors, and powers. The stronger power devices will have a much narrower field of view and require a more sophisticated user. This does not mean the older student gets the higher powered device, as I've had many first graders using the 8X telescope efficiently. Let's look at some of these devices. The telescope on the top left is the typical barrel type telescope that comes in many sizes and powers. Next to it are two examples of one-handed focusing devices. On the bottom left are adjustable distance glasses marketed for watching TV. And the last one pictured here is a tablet. Tablets have a camera feature that allows the user to take a photo and enlarge whatever might be in the distance writing on the board, for example, or watching an enlarging action across the room in real time. Again, experiment in advance with your students and encourage them to express their needs and preferences in the clinical low vision setting. A bioptic telescope is another type of distance device. In this photo, a student has put on a bioptic and very often this is thought of as just it's that tool for driving but for some students it works very well in the classroom when they're uh, looking at material on the whiteboard uh, for hands-free viewing so that can be one of those uh, more sophisticated tools to use we also want to think about that range of tasks that occur throughout the day what are the many many distance activities that we are doing. Some of these include, um, a, a lot of with travel, is identifying uh, that bus number. Is that the one you're needing? Being able to look at uh, road signs or identifying landmarks. So helping students to understand what are those skills uh, for them to gain that independent travel. Items such as looking at overhead menus. Um, this is, again, part of that self-determination with, I can see what I want to see when I want to see it. Advertisements on buildings is another thing, and I do this frequently, whether from the bus window or walking, always looking for the, that discount or the sale or the new product that's out there. So uh, I have better information by using my telescope. In a wide open space, um, if I'm need, looking for someone's car or locating a friend, I have a responsibility to use my telescope as well to be part of that locating process. In the standard living room, uh, seeing a television screen is one way that the telescope can be helpful. Typically, a living room is set up for 10 to 15 feet away from with the couch to the TV screen and whether I'm watching in my living room or a friend's I want that to be a space that's comfortable and being able to use my telescope there. Spectator activities such as whether it's a sports field or a uh, theater being able to look at the detail there, seeing the exertion on the face of the athlete or looking at the costumes of the actors on stage. It's picking up on those details. And then again, we frequently refer to students um, with using the telescope to see information on the whiteboard in the classroom. So that's one of the more familiar tasks. Think of the many, many things you look at through the day. Is your student doing this? Whereas there are many styles of distance devices, for the most part they can be divided into two categories of devices most prescribed by low vision specialists. Handheld devices are small, lightweight, and relatively inexpensive. Some have short focus capability, which comes in handy for looking through a glass display case. We typically see devices ranging in power from 2.5x to 8x with children. 
However, the higher the power, the less light is coming into that barrel, making it difficult for students with etiologies such as retinopathy of prematurity and optic nerve hypoplasia that make lighting a crucial factor in clarity. Handheld devices will require specialized instruction. Clip-on telescopes are marketed as beneficial for prolonged viewing and tend to work better if the individual is not able to hold the hand steady, such as those students with cerebral palsy. They are low-powered and literally clip onto a pair of glasses. However, these add extra weight to the glasses and are typically not tolerated by school-age students as well. As mentioned earlier, the higher power of the telescope, the narrower the field is going to be. The photo on the left is a lower powered telescope like a 2.5 or a 4X, and the photo on the right demonstrates what happens when you have a higher power. You may need more detail though, depending on your acuity and the task. O&M specialists tend to prefer the high power devices because the distances they can access are far greater. As with the magnifier, you want to match the tool to the task and setting. If your student needs more than one power, be sure you inform the low vision specialists of this need. The telescope tends to be a less user-friendly tool. With magnifiers, some students adjust to that very quickly and pick it up and training time is minimal. But telescopes can be a more challenging tool and I want to point out a couple of these. The first challenge I want to talk about is magnification of motion. Any shaking is amplified and the image is blurred. That speed of a moving object is exaggerated. The second challenge, distortion of distance. Objects appear closer together and closer to the viewer than they actually are. So there's that disorientation of spatial perception. That needs time for the student to have practice and recognize how these objects actually appear in reality. Third, the field of view is restricted. It's that tunnel effect when you're putting that telescope up to your eye and it's counterintuitive to I'm blocking out peripheral information. Uh, controlling targets in the distance is much harder. So they easily come out of view. The student has to practice at I've moved off the target, now I need to be able to come back to it. So all of that takes uh, time to adjust. There are also factors that it's helpful to discuss with the student that contribute to their proficiency. It's tolerance of these telescope restrictions. Getting beyond that first response of, oh, it's, I don't like having this thing in front of my eye. But with practice, it gets better. The fifth practice session is better than the first practice session. Students also have the option to choose to not use the device and talking with students about those instances can be helpful for them to anticipate when the, uh, it's not helpful to bring out the tool. The perceptual skills of recognizing part to whole. So when looking through the telescope, I'm just getting a piece of an image out there and being able to put that together. So uh, looking for, at words across a board, they need time to develop that skill. It's familiarity with um, the magnified object and this can be activities at near, practicing um, reading a joke and then doing it in the distance so that they have that high success. Loss of control due to the distance environment can also be a frustrating factor for students. There's clutter, there's movement in the background, and it takes practice to stay on the target and be able to um, identify the information that they need. Also lighting issues, dim lighting or very bright lighting or separating what's in a shadow, all of these take its practice, practice, practice. Uh, Eye-hand coordination is the last 
factor that's helpful to review with a student that this takes time to build the skill. So being able to pick up that telescope and quickly get it in place is uh, one of those last skills to talk about with the student. So your student has their telescope and maybe two different powers of telescopes. Let's talk about the skills they will need to learn to be proficient. The skills we will cover are awareness of the dominant eye, localization, fixation, focusing, spotting, scanning, tracing, and tracking. Teaching awareness of the dominant eye involves helping the student determine the best eye for the most efficient use of his vision with a telescope. This is not necessarily the eye in which the vision is clearer, but rather the eye the child prefers to use when looking through a monocular telescope. The left picture shows the child looking through a kaleidoscope first. Allow the child to experiment with each eye, then reinforce consistent use. If the child has difficulty suppressing the unaided eye, you might try a patch temporarily. Most people automatically hold the telescope up to their dominant eye. The next skill, localization, is visually selecting an object in the distance from objects around it. Finding one sign among others is a localization task. In this instance, Students were asked to find the sign for the coffee shop first without a device, then verifying with the benefit of more magnification. Following local localizing, we work with a student on proper positioning and stabilizing the telescope. The young student on the left is taught positioning first with a paper roll tube. Then her teacher will quickly move to a telescope she learns how to rest the tube or device against her face, aligning it with her eye. She also learns proper grasp. The student on the right is supporting her elbow as she views through the lens. You will want to start with the student seated for these lessons, elbow resting on a desk or table. When there is no table, you will see students rest their elbow on their knee while sitting. When I'm introducing a telescope to young elementary age students, I ask their teacher to position the student's desk so that the arm using the telescope is resting on a surface. I never, however, isolate the student from his peers in regards to seating. Once you localize an object with the unaided eye, you spot it through a telescope to verify detail. This student first localized the clock on the wall then lifted the telescope to her eye to spot it and verify the time. We now want to move to the skill of focusing. That's bringing an image into clearest view. You can start these lessons without a telescope. Uh, using a LCD projector or a camera with each of those uh, items, the student and you can identify what's clear and what's blurry. For students who have a high refractive error, your uh, distinction of clear may be slightly different than the students, but you'll get close. And the students can have fun uh, taking things into extreme blur and then bringing it back. So um, you'll then want to start with a pre-focused telescope so you're making sure that the student has that immediate success. And then on the next slide, the, we use the terms open and closed on the telescope. When with the barrel type telescopes, when it's closed, it's all the way short. And typically that's for seeing something that's farther away. When the student opens the telescope, makes it long, they're pulling in that mid-range task. And so being able to get that hand movement down quickly uh, helps the student to feel more comfortable as they're using the tool. So we want the student to s get to the clearest image. And I always practice with my students by letting them know, OK, I'm going to mess it up. 
and now you put it back to the right spot. So again, it's only when the student goes past clear into blurry are they figuring out, I found the clearest spot. So we do a lot of that back and forth with, okay, you reset it. And I use the line with the students, we don't want just good enough focus, we want the best focus. And helping students to hold that high standard of seeing sharp edges. In these photos, a student is adjusting focus to allow for a variety of planes. Uh, so in the first picture, he's just looking at the building, but in the second picture, he's looking at the front bus and then further down the sidewalk behind that bus, watching the door to see if his friend comes out. And when I work with students, I want to make sure that when they are taking on that more challenging task or in an unfamiliar environment, that they've developed the skill and so that they can devote the energy to the challenge of uh, the harder task that they've picked up. Some young students have difficulty focusing the telescope, so what I might do is go into their classroom first and see where these barrels are aligned for the chalkboard and where they might be aligned for something a little closer, and then I'm going to mark the barrels of the telescope themselves. I typically use fingernail polish, so I may put one color on this part and then two different colors on the bottom part and then I might say put it right here when you want to see the board but then move it here when you want to watch somebody talking in the middle of the classroom. Okay we're making progress. The next skill that we're going to talk about is tracing and that's visually following stationary lines. Position the student when you start these lessons. Typically, you start off with a horizontal line. Those are pretty easy to find in a school setting. Um, the edge along a board, the edge along a door frame, uh, placing letters, numbers, shapes, where the student is following the targets and then naming them to you in order. Um, locate lines. It start without the telescope so the student can identify for you what they see and then bring the telescope up so that you're adding the tool then into the lesson. Move the head, not the eye, so that they're developing that smooth, fluid movement while following a line. And once the student has gained proficiency with these horizontal and vertical lines, you can start with the more advanced skill of lines that move away from the student, like down a school hallway, uh, posters along the wall, or in a gymnasium, um, objects along a line that projects out into the distance, uh, balls or different kind of targets that they can identify. In this picture, we have a couple of opportunities for tracing. The traffic sign, if the student traces up the silver pole, they find the big 15 speed limit, and so that's a flat vertical plane. But if the student then does the skill of tracing down the sidewalk, there's a car at the end of the sidewalk and the student can identify when the car is moving and what direction it's turning. So both within the school setting and outdoors, there are opportunities for tracing. Our next skill is scanning. Scanning involves making repetitive fixations that are required to look from one target to another. Here we see a boy on a beginner scanning lesson. He's moving his head as he looks through the telescope to follow a pattern moving from left to right and top to bottom. You can teach scanning by placing stickers on mortar between bricks, asking the student to scan in this same pattern as he names the pictures on the stickers. There are several fun games noted in the Looking to Learn book in the chapter on telescope training. Scanning is a crucial skill for reading the infamous chalkboard, whiteboard, or whatever is used in the student's classroom. In the community, we might scan to find a product on the grocery store shelf, or scan to find the slide or a friend on the playground. 
I cover scanning thoroughly as early as kindergarten and beginning first graders. I can't express strongly enough the necessity for direct or explicit one-to-one -one training sessions for this skill. I start with scanning to find and copy symbols, words, sentences, and finally paragraphs of up to 15 words. Materials have got to be fun. I use funny poems, children's magazines, and other high interest materials as I teach this skill. The following two slides are examples of teacher-made materials I have used to teach scanning in conjunction with copying. For the bird feeder instructions, I ask my student to copy the instructions, the red lines indicating chunks that I want the student to view, put down the telescope, and write. As scanning skill improves, the lines or chunks will get longer. Once the student is copying up to 15 words with one glance, my lessons on scanning are over. First graders who are proceeding on grade level in reading can complete this goal with 60 minutes a week direct instruction. Since I do carry my materials in my car, my copying activities are prepared on spiral charts using bright markers. I might also carry a roll-up laminated whiteboard to write on in any setting. Whenever I do telescope training with a young student, particularly third grade or younger, I like to prepare a little booklet that I take in when I'm teaching spe the specific skill of copying um, from the board. And so this is an example of a little book that I made for one student, Billy, and we'll look inside and you can see what kinds of things I have in here that I used with with Billy every time I went to the school. So for example, the first sheet in here is um, the beginning conversation we might have about what you can see with or without a monocular telescope. So he has written, um, or I wrote for him actually because he was young, um, what he saw without a monocular, um, which was kids on a playground, trees, and food in the lunch line, and then what he could see with a monocular. Um, so writing on the board and birds, etc. The next page it says about points, and this is the behavior system that I use with kids where I'm reinforcing them for using their telescope, but I have a conversation with the kids in advance on what would you like to exchange points for? And points are um, little chips, like a blue chip means one point and a white might mean five points, etc. cetera. So um, these are the kinds of things that, that this student would be rewarded um, with. So um, when I walk into the room and I see you using the telescope, that's your highest point value. Um, for every time your teacher tells me you are using the t you have used the telescope in the past week, you get points. Um, if you finish your homework on a uh, telescope that I gave you, that's a po that has a point value, etc. Uh, the third page um, has what happens to the points. So for him, um, his most valued thing, um, and this is going to date me, but his most valued thing were, were Pokemon cards. He would do anything for a Pokemon card. So um, his top choice would be Pokemon cards that he could exchange those points for. Um, another one might be for him to play a game with me during our work time, um, have a special breakfast or lunch with me, um, etc. He, he never got past the Pokemon cards, though. He always wanted those. The next page I have is a record of the points he earned and exchanged. So this was always um, consulted sitting open during our lesson. And you will see we started um, telescope training in, in January. And it has the column, one column has the date, one has the points earned, one has the points spent, and then what he spent those points on. So um, uh, this is just the, the 
all the points he earned between January and um, on this sheet February, but it kept going. Then on the um, inside, uh, on the next page, I hadn't created a page for this, but I saw that I needed one. Um, I was keeping track of um, the different kinds of things he was doing to earn points. So I was, in addition to the telescope training, I was working on organization. So you'll see the word desk, and that means that his desk was neat when I came. Uh, copying his homework and riddles would be something he did with me in class. So it's all added up there. Um, then the next page is the record of monocular speed and accuracy. This was always open um, as we worked and you'll see um, in the columns date, number of words in the sample. Um, there's a column for time. I didn't keep track of the time, in, in other words, how long it took him to copy something, um, because for this particular child that was a little stressful, so I just didn't do it. Then there's a column that says, did you check your work, yes or no, and um, the number of correct words on the final draft. So in other words, I would put something up, they would read it, they would copy it, and then I would ask, do you think you made any mistakes? and I wanted them to check those words they thought they hadn't gotten right and then correct them. Then I took a grade. So you had the opportunity to correct your work. So on this you see in February there were four words in the sample. In parentheses I put eight peaks. So that means it took him eight different peaks with the telescope before he could copy those four words. Um, he corrected himself, and then he got four words correct. So that's 100%. Um, I'm going to go on down to the bottom of this. Um, in May, um, he had 22 words in that copying sample. He did that in one peak. He checked his work, and he missed nothing. So. As far as I'm concerned, he was finished with the goal of copying words from, from the board. In this case, he could copy up to 22 words in, a, in one peak with 100% accuracy. So this was very motivating to this child to see his progress. Um, it was very motivating to me as well. I have his actual work here. Um, this paper that's dated in January um, has one sentence on it. We were making that bird feeder that was referred to previously. Um, he has one sentence here. It was very difficult for him to do. Um, uh, he was copying letters at a time, not words at a time. So that's at the beginning of the semester. Then this next page that has A's across the top is the next month. Um, and you'll see I was working on a column format, and he was copying words. Um, and then he copied a sentence, the ant is little, and he did that in one peak. So now we've gone from l copying one letter at a time or one word at a time to, in February already, four words at a time, and he drew a picture of an ant. Um, so now I'm going to zoom you ahead to May, which was the end of, of this goal. Um, he has his name at the top nicely. Um, he, he did this entire copying activity was the one that's 22 words with one peak self-corrected. And you see not only how, how clean it is um, and nicely it's done, um, he did that all with one peak of the telescope and then writing everything down on his paper from memory, going back and correcting himself. At last we come to tracking, the final and most sophisticated skill on our list. Um, lessons that 
include working with tracking can be so interesting for students. Examples like watching a pep rally in a school setting or having that field trip of going to the zoo and being able to follow the animals um, with the telescope. This is just a couple examples for tracking. Start with an object that is stationary and then require that the uh, student places the telescope uh, against their eye and move the head smoothly to follow the target. So reading print on the board or watching uh, someone walk across the front of a room can be examples. Um, items that start at the left and move to the right is the direction that we're most familiar with. Instruct the student to support the arm holding the telescope. So always checking that positioning and stabilizing to make sure that that habit is in place. Taking the student into different environments to expand their skill. So this is in the different school settings, such as the concourse, um, the gymnasium, the athletic field. All of these have movement in them, so you can find activities um, that the student can follow with the telescope. Slowly decrease the target size and increase the distance. Again, we've uh, mentioned that before, but this is that awareness of the student recognizing, I'm getting better. Uh, my expertise is building. Um, have the student follow the targets again with a smooth movement, and then finding those things that move in variable patterns, uh, more unpredictable, like birds outside of the school, or uh, children on a playground, or even athletes on a soccer field, um, because they're moving backwards and in those more unpredictable movements. So that builds skill for the student. In these photos, we have some instances of tracking in real life. That's on the soccer field and then actors on a stage. Now that we've covered the six skills listed on the chart, we want to mention some fine tuning, some of that getting to the uh, highest level of skill with telescope work, kind of a telescope Olympics. Think of one-handed focusing for students if they are uh, wanting to keep a hold of the pen and just be able to adjust the focus um, in high school classrooms that can help build their speed. Um, checking their speed and accuracy with copying information from the board or reading more complex signs or um, information that's out there so that they, they know they're getting faster and faster. Look for those mid-range tasks. These can be a little more difficult to find, but um, are important for the student to have practice with building that skill. So for example, um, items in a prepared food case, these can take place during O&M lessons where they're in a grocery store and looking at that, or in a mall or office that has that directory. And even better if there's uh, glass in front of that, so you're having to deal with glare. All of these are part of that, getting that um, most developed skill in place. Development of optical device skill leads to visual in independence for so many students. Pictured here is a student who cannot hold a telescope steady, but with a mounted telescope she's able to watch the basketball game. Just think of the social implications this has for her. So let's pull it all together now. The efficient optical device user is ready to incorporate all the skills together for some sophisticated tasks, but now you will apply these skills in increasingly complex or visually busy environments where objects appear and move rapidly through one, more than one focal plane and the visual demands are high. Examples of the more complex settings include traffic, sports events, and crowded spaces such as the mall, school hall, and airports. You will need to go beyond the school building, teach optical device efficiency on field trips, in stores, and in new areas. Help your student create a PowerPoint or a journal of places and events they're seeing with devices and share these with teachers, parents, and friends. 
This student, a ninth grader, is the ideal. She has moved from training to integrated use and truly has her eyes on the world moving toward competitive employment. Isn't that our goal for all of our students? We've spent a great amount of time in this presentation concentrating on skills for using both near and distance devices. And that skill development is very, very important. So then as final thoughts, I want to mention it's also an awareness of the benefits that the student can anticipate. How is this tool going to help me? And recognizing the limitations. It's not a perfect tool, but it can work well to get information that I want in some settings. So bringing that all together, developing the skills, anticipating the benefits, and having awareness of the limitations, all of this leads to that successful device use. Thank you for joining us for this first of three web-based instruction modules on teaching students to use optical devices. Remember, a number of good resources are available to help you develop your skills as you teach your students to use devices. Keep it fun, keep it interesting, and keep the goal in mind. Presentation 2 will cover device use in a range of environments, and Presentation 3 will focus on the psychosocial issues related to using optical devices.